uh, the trio that did this book together, the Beatles. Um, we think the Beatles are the greatest band in the history of the universe. <laughs> do we? <laughs> do we have Beatle fans here? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to. Um, I'm Kathy Crawl. My husband Paul Brewer and our fabulous artist Stacy Innerst, who is not a woman, he's a man. And we did it. We didn't know that until last night. We met him for the first time no. last night. He's no. amazing. No. no, we had, did not meet him until last night. No. And he's done. And he's done three of my books, which is really spectacular. But I'm going to just tell you the story real briefly, and then um, Paul is going to talk a little about about how we wrote the why we wrote the book. And then Stacy's going to do magic things. And we'll have questions and answers if people have questions for us. So this is the Beatles were fab and they were funny. Music was everywhere in Liverpool, where John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr grew up. Their lives were hard, but they made the most of their lives with humor. From the time they got together as lads until they became superstars, the Fab Four made music, they made history, and they made people laugh. John, Paul, George, and Ringo always had fun together, even when they were trying to name their band. The Blackjacks, the Quarrymen, Johnny and the Moondogs, the Nurk Twins, the Beatles, the Silver Beatles, the Silver Beatles, the Rainbows, Long John Silver and the Pieces of Eight, <laughs> Long John and the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles, the Beatles. In 1960, they finally decided on the Beatles. The name just made them laugh. In their early days, they performed for hours and hours for almost no pay in seedy little clubs. And they used laughter to keep their spirits up. John would shout, where are we going, lads? To the top, Johnny, and where is that? The toppermost of the poppermost, the others would yell and go on with the show. When they got a new producer, the Beatles tried hard to make a good impression, but the producer did not like them. He made a long list of things he didn't like about them. Then he said politely, let me know if there's anything you don't like. And George said, well, first start, I don't like your tie. <laughs> the producer laughed, but then he still had the Beatles sing their song 17 times in a row that night before he was satisfied with it. It was Love Me Do, and that was their first hit. Um, when the time of their second hit came out, Please Please Me, the band began appearing on British TV. They were having so much fun. The songs were great, but the lads themselves were just so cool, so funny, so fab, short for fabulous, that the reporters started calling them the Fab Four. The first Beatles fan club started with 35 members and soon grew to 40,000. Fans stocked up on what the Beatles said were their favorite candy, squishy jelly babies that you could only get in England. It was the birth of something new, Beatle mania. The fans wanted more, so John and Paul wrote songs over tea and cornflakes. When they wrote She Loves You, Paul's father begged them to change its yeah, yeah, yeah line to a more serious yes, yes, yes. But Paul, <laughs> but Paul laughed the idea off with a no, no, no. And yeah, yeah, yeah was soon heard around the world. The Beatles were no longer playing in small clubs. They were even invited to perform for the British royal family. And John invited the main floor audience to clap along, and then he pointed up at the royal family and said, and the rest of you, just rattle your jewelry. And that made everybody <laughs> laugh. The Beatles had their first number one hit in America with I Want to Hold Your Hand. They were so excited. Although John still had to joke, he liked to call the song I Want to Hold Your Nose. <laughs> then the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan show. This is the best Ed Sullivan that I've ever seen. He just, he's just like all spindly, and you can just hear him saying, and here's, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, um, their performance was the most watched TV show in history, and by this time they had performed thousands of times together, so it was very polished. When they started giving concerts around America, they liked the screaming at first. George said, we like screams, so scream louder and louder. Um, the, the way they dealt with everything was, again, through laughter. Uh, they regretted talking about their favorite candy, those squishy jelly babies, because in America, you couldn't get those. So people would throw jelly beans at them, or much harder. And uh, the Beatles were not crazy about that. Um, John had an idea, would you just eat your jelly beans and not throw them at us, please? 
So the Beatlemania roller coaster took them all around the United States giving concerts. Um, the Beatlemania was so intense that the screaming of the fans would drown out the songs. The Beatles thought this was hilarious. The, more, the less their music could be heard, the more money they were making and the more popular they became. Anything they touched went on sale immediately. And this is my only connection to the Beatles. Even the ho hotel sheets they slept on were cut into tiny squares and sold as souvenirs. And my dad, when the Beatles played in Chicago, bought me their bed sheets to cut into little squares. <laughs> I assume they were not washed or anything, but, but it, it was very cool. So the Beatles were constantly interviewed and people would ask them the same silly questions over and over again. So John would say, this is, these are a few quotes from John. Question, which one are you, John? Eric. <laughs> Question, some people think your haircuts are un-American. John, well that was very observant because actually we are not American. <laughs> Question, how do you find all this business of having screaming girls following you all over the place? George, we feel flattered. John, and flattened. Question, do you go to the barber at all? Paul, just to keep it trimmed. But sometimes we do it ourselves, you know, just for fun. John, with our feet. <laughs> Question, what is your favorite sport? Paul, sleeping. Question, is your hair real? Paul, is yours? Question, you Beatles have conquered five continents. What do you want to do next? Paul, conquer six. Question, what do you call your hairstyle? George, Arthur. <laughs> Question, what do you do when you're cooped up in a hotel room? George, we ice skate. <laughs> Question, what do you do with all the money that you make? George, I'm changing mine into pennies. I'm going to fill up a room with it and dive into it. Question, what do you think of Beethoven? Ringo, great, especially his poems. Jo uh, Question, how many of you are bald that you have to wear those wigs? Ringo, all of us. Question, how did you find America? Ringo, we went to Greenland and made a left turn. And on their last American tour, they played the largest live concert in history. And it was the, the screaming of the fans was getting out of control. And plus, they were in danger of getting trampled by fans. They were um, playing at Chase Stadium with two airports nearby. You couldn't hear the Beatles and you couldn't hear the jet tank taken off from the two airports. And a reporter asked, where would you like to go that you haven't gone yet? And John said, home. <laughs> and they did. Beatlemania had driven fans wild all over the world, but the Fab Four were forgetting how to laugh. So they went back to their studio. It was the end of Beatlemania. But they went back where they continued to make songs, make each other laugh, and they could hear themselves again. John, Paul, George, and Ringo recorded more than 200 songs that we still listen to today. For decades after, their music would inspire to sing along, dance, love, remember, cry, think, imagine, and laugh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We had done a book, well, I've done some uh, joke books to, uh, by myself, not with Kathy. Done three joke books, and we've always wanted to do humorous books together. So a few years ago, we did a book called Fartiste, which is a very funny book that's on sale inside there. It's a true story. Um, that we wanted to do something else after that, so we, Kathy had done a book called Lives of the Presidents, and in that book, she had Lincoln. Lincoln had a great sense of humor, liked to tell jokes, funny stories. So our next book was Lincoln Tells a Joke. Uh, what's the subtitle? Uh, Lincoln Tells a Joke? Oh, Laughter Saves. How uh, Lincoln and the Nation. Right. Something, Something like, like, Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're so good we can't remember the title of it. I mean, that, that really goes to show how great we are. But uh, so we did that book, and we got hooked up with an illustrator that had already done a book with Kathy called Emma's for Music, which is also here, Stacy Innerst. We were excited beyond belief that we were gonna get him for the Lincoln book. After the Lincoln book, we went to uh, lots of power breakfasts and brainstorm another idea, you know, what, what we can do next. And we were at one of our lunches or breakfasts or whatever, and I said, remember the Beatles, how funny they were when they first, when Beatles first came to America, they did all those interviews that like, it, you talked about it in the book. And they were always hysterical, man. Everything they said was funny. And I said, that is a germ of an idea right there.
Kathy said, perfect, we're going to do it. We sold the book almost immediately. So then we got hooked up with Stacy. We were very happy about that. So that is, in a nutshell, how that book got uh, started. And now I'm going to turn it over to Stacy so he has more time. Yeah, I was thrilled to be able to do my third book with, uh, with Kathy and Paul. The first book, my first children's book was Emma's for Music. And I was, when I got that book, I, I was an art student. I mean, a fine art student. I studied art history. I didn't do any illustration. I didn't even know what illustration was. I wasn't trained to do it. So I had this very goofy kind of portfolio. But I started doing editorial uh, art for newspapers. And I was, I was in San Diego, and I took my portfolio to Harcourt. And I showed it to Jeanette Larson, our editor at Harcourt. And uh, Emma's for Music is the first book she, she sent me. And I thought, yes, this I can do. It was an alphabet book. And every page, I got to do something completely different. I didn't have to be disciplined. I didn't have to come up with characters. So it was a great way for me to, to get an entree into doing children's books. And, uh, and then a few years later, I got to do uh, the Lincoln book, which was which was so great because I loved Lincoln when I was a kid. And I, I got to bring all of that strange sort of surrealistic weirdness that I do in all of my pictures anyway. And for some reason, their books allow me to do that and to take a lot of liberties and to do some things that aren't traditionally seen in a biography. And our editor actually lets me do it too. In fact, she encourages me to do it, uh, which is a great gift. I mean. Basically, I send things in and I think, oh, this will never fly. And she says, yeah, that'll do. Only take it a little bit farther. Make it more strange. So, And for the Beatles, I got to take it to an, an even greater degree because it's rock and roll. And, and uh, you know, how do you show screaming fans without just doing a cast of thousands, which I don't particularly like to do? Um, so I just did the mouths which look a little like the Rolling Stones, actually. But <laughs> not to mix yeah, metaphors, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I was hoping nobody would, you know, catch me on the... You, yeah, I figured you would. So the Stones are going to sue you, I hear. Uh, everybody's going to sue me. So are the Beatles for doing the Abbey Road thing, so... But yeah, that was the other thing. I mean, I, I kept on doing these pictures, and I thought they're based on these iconic photographs of the Beatles, like the, you know, crossing Abbey Road. And for some reason, they all said, that's fine, go ahead. And the lawyers looked at it and apparently it was all right. So, so I, I ran with it. And uh, I do wanna, I wanna give you chan a chance to ask any questions because I mean, I could just talk and talk, but I know I'd have questions if, if I was uh, in front of an illustrator. So. Could you talk a little bit about your process? You get the text from them? Yeah. And then what media do you use and kind of how do you? Yeah. I brought, I actually brought visual aids, but I can't touch them because I'm holding this, and, which is okay. No, it's okay. It's okay. I brought a sketchbook to show you how it all starts, but. Okay. I'll do this quickly. I know we don't have much time, but this is the, a small sketchbook. Hold on. Is that good? Is that good? Okay. All right. So it, it starts like this. I mean, this is my small sketchbook. And I just do, this is actually, these are some Lincoln sketches, but I've got Beatles things in here too. And I, this, it's very rough and very crude, but it's just a way of, of getting the thoughts out of my head and onto a piece of paper. Um, and, I do, and then I start with doing the characters I don't know if you can make any sense of this because it's not, as you can see, it's very disorganized, but this is the kind of thing I do just so I can start to visualize the book. And then I've got a larger sketchbook, which I couldn't bring because I flew here, but um, that's when I really start to do things that are more, more involved and I really start to figure out, you know, wardrobes and things like that um, and do some color sketches too. But for me, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's not a traditional way of working because I don't, I, I kind of don't like to do the sketches. I get impatient with sketches and I want them to approve the sketches so I can go to the paintings as quickly as possible. And, and fortunately, uh, 
my editors so far have let me do that. So I can go to the paintings, and because I work fairly quickly, I can do a painting, scan it, send it to them, they can get an idea of what it looks like, and then they can say yes or no. And I don't really mind starting over again because I work quickly, but that's just me. I kind of work in a scattershot sort of approach. And I'll, I'll usually start with, I'll find one spread in the book where I think this really defines what the story is gonna be about. I don't do the cover first, I don't do page one first. I'll just find whatever spread really speaks to me about what the characters are and, and what's gonna tell the story the best, and I'll do that one first, and that'll set the tone. And uh, the other thing I do is for every book I've done, the medium's been different. It's, it's, this one was acrylic on, uh, on illustration board, but I did, first book I did with Kathy was Emma's for Music, and that was oil and acrylic, and I painted on tin, and I collaged things together, and that was a mess, but it was a lot of fun. And they were, they were really, they, when I sent them in, you know, they had all this dimension, and they were this thick, you know, and they had the tin glued on board and everything, so they said, we're not sure how we're gonna shoot this to actually reproduce it, but they did, and they're, they're masters. Uh, that's what I love about doing children's books, is they're so good at the production. Their production values are so high, and everything's so beautiful, so. How was it painting on the denim? That was kind of a challenge, too. Yeah, I did, for Levi Strauss, I did paintings on jeans, and I just tore up all of the jeans I had, and I tore up my friend's jeans, and my, <laughs> my kid's jeans. And I, I went to the Goodwill and I got jeans. But uh, I, I just tore them into, I had to get big jeans because I needed big spreads. So, so I went to the Goodwill and I got the biggest jeans I could find. And uh, what's that? I should have, but I didn't. It would, have, it would have been a lot easier had I done that. But I, I just, uh, I ironed them really well. And I gessoed them and then I ironed them again. And they were pretty flat by the time I was ready to paint. So. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was called Levi Strauss Gets a Bright Idea. Oh. And it was, um, I just, I had done three or four paintings already for the book, just the traditional way, and I sent them in, and they said, yeah, those are good to go. And then I said, and then I thought, I got the idea to do, to do it on denim, and, and I said, I'm starting over again, and they, and they said, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the way you roll, go ahead. <laughs> so that was, that was exciting and yeah. fun. I work in my home, and I've just got a, it's not big, but it's, uh, it's on the lower level of my house, and uh, uh, I wish, but I, I live in Pennsylvania, so the light's not so natural, <laughs> so I have a lot of, I have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of lighting in there. Um, I do have some natural light, but I'm surrounded by trees, so it's filtered light, you know, anyway. Anybody else? I don't know how much time we have. I have a oh, okay. I was just curious. Oh. No, that's you. Oh. <laughs> I was just curious um, if there is a particular reason why you move to a different media each time. Yeah, just to stay interested, really. I mean, because I, I, I don't know. I, for some reason, it helps me be more creative if I'm challenged a little bit with each one, you know. Um, plus, sometimes it kind of, like in the case of Levi, it really, you know, it suited the story. So that was, that's the reason I chose at that time. But I just, I love to work in all different kinds of media. And um, so it's, yeah, it just keeps me interested. I like oil the best, but I can't always use it. So um, how about way in the back? Well, <laughs> <laughs> where the us, humor maybe? comes in. Yes. Um, we have a great time working together. Yeah. We very rarely argue or d disagree about anything. Oh. And um, <laughs> we have a really good time. We go out for breakfasts and lunches and occasionally for drinks. And we brainstorm. And um, we each think each other is fabulous. Paul does most of the research and the initial writing, and then I come in and play around with it, give it back to him. He works on it, and we just keep passing it back and forth until it's in a final shape where neither of us sees anything more that can be 
um, changed about it. But I did want to ask Stacy real quick, is there anything that you want to paint on that you haven't done yet that you want an idea for? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but the beetle sheets. <laughs> Live human beings. Oh, no. so. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. No, no. And that's the funny thing is, is that uh, the editor that we've worked with on these books is very cautious. She's a, a super cautious human. Yep. And I mean, she's really good at what she does, but she doesn't like to take risks. So the fact that she's let us do this is pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> no, humans. No. I'll probably have to forget about that. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Um, right here. Uh, one question. more oh. question here. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Who's going to go? <laughs> okay, uh, my voice is a little bit. Okay. <laughs> uh, you said you had um, just history training in art. Did you get the technical medium training somewhere else, or did you train yourself in a different medium? Uh, I got some of it when I was in school. Uh, I went to the University of New Mexico, and they had a really good painting program there. So I learned traditional painting techniques and then forgot a lot of them, and then <laughs> kind of reinvented them. And, and uh, I, I still use a lot of the things that I learned in school, but I also kind of do, you know, a lot of it's trial and error too. 